Okay, hello everyone. My name is Shimi, Shimi Bandiel from Trainologic, and I'm going to talk about uh, extensible effects versus uh, Mona transformers. And some of you know me, I'm a big fan of monads, and I'm going to talk about it again. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about uh, abstractions, why we want them to have abstractions in our code, what are good abstractions. I will give an example of a uh, very important abstraction called the uh, functor, and then we'll go to monads and see the problems there and uh, two solutions, uh, monad transform transformers and extensible effects, compare them, see some code, and hopefully you will use one of them in production for greater good. How many of you have used the monad abstraction in code just to have... Oh, that's great. Okay. More than zero. <laughs> okay, so let's start from the beginning. We want abstractions. Uh, what are abstractions? Abstractions are uh, contracts, interfaces that allow us to write code in one place that can deal with many, many instances of the abstractions. A good example, a very popular example for an abstraction is the ordering abstraction in Scala or the comparator abstraction in Java. And if we define the contract of uh, ordering, then we can use, uh, we can create implementation for sort, for minimum, for maximum, and we don't want, and nobody will, create an implementation for sorting of servers, of sorting of list of persons, etc. Okay, so abstraction is very important. And what is an abstraction? Abstraction is composed of four parts, the interface, the trait, the abstract contract. Uh, some laws, uh, I'm not going to dwell over it in this uh, presentation, but every and each abstraction has inherent laws. Uh, for example, ordering, comparator, there are laws for transitivity. If A is less than B, then B must be greater than A, something like that. We have instances of the abstraction. We have... Uh, a comparator of person, maybe several of them, comparator for server, for uh, threads, for whatever, many instances. And the most important thing in the abstraction is the gain. What can I write in one place, in a single place, that I will not need to re repeat myself? For example, sorting a list, minimum and maximum, according to ordering or comparator. Now, what's that got to do with monad transformers? And uh, let's see. Okay, so we are familiar with uh, the simple abstractions like ordering. Now, in Scala, we have a syntactic uh, feature which can allow us to create hierarchy in the types, uh, what, uh, types that depend on generic of generics. And this allows us, like this, the, the class buzz depends on a single generic G, which itself must accept a single generic. Okay, like G could be option, it could be list, it could be many other types, like try, future. Okay, and this is called an higher kind of type. And this allows us to create some abstractions that we cannot do in languages like, God forbid, Java or C Sharp. So, let's start from one abstraction and then we'll see the relationship to the monad. Let's start with the things we can map over. Now, in Scala, we are all familiar with the map function that appears on many, many types, like on traversables, on future, on try, on uh, option, okay? And maybe we can use an abstraction here, because each and every one of them has a map. The map is the same sort of interface. Uh, it takes a function from A to B, works on option of A, returns an option of B. Maybe we can, we can have an abstraction here, and actually we can. There is an abstraction called functor. Let's see it. You see here a trait functor, we receive some higher generic type, F. It can be list, it can be option, think about it as option, let's say. And the map accepts an option of A, F of A, function from A to B, 
and we'll return an option of B or a list of B or whatever F is. There are some laws, but we're not going to go over them. So this is the contract for the functor abstraction. There are laws, but not going to talk about it. There are instances like list and option and a lot of other uh, instances. But what is the gain? Well, I created it. Well, what can I do with it? Well, actually, there are many gains to the functor abstraction, but I'm not going to go over them in this presentation. We're, not, we're going to go over one of them. Okay? It appears that if you have a functor of a functor, uh, like a list of option or option of list or option of future or future of option or future of list or whatever, two functors composed one inside the other, then the result is a functor itself. Okay, let's see it in the code. Now this is a little bit complicated code. I'm not going to go over implementations like this in this uh, presentation, but you see here I have a functor f, given a functor for g, then I can get a functor of f of g. Okay, I'm using here the syntax for the kind projector uh, plugin, uh, not using lamb lambda or lambda types. Uh, <laughs> um, I will try. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> you don't need to read this. Okay, no. Okay, don't, don't read this. That's a functor of a functor is a functor. Okay, <laughs> that, that's it. Now, but why is it important? Because every gain, every code I can write on a general functor will work over a composition of functors, over a stack of functors. For example, if I have a code that depends on a functor and I just want to do a map over it, okay, just want to invoke some function over it, then given a list of future, of option, of try, of future, of list, of option, I can do a single map all the way inside. This is what this composition means. Okay? And I'm showing this because what I'm going to show you later is that the monad abstraction, which I will focus over, doesn't provide this feature. And because it doesn't have this feature, we need to choose something like monad transformers or ex extensible effects. Okay? So, functors composed. And I can use everything that I can write over a functor, use it over a stack of functors. Okay, so, now let's talk about the more important stuff, the stuff we can flat map over, okay? Why is flat map more important? Because there is a special syntax in Scala for flat mapping, the four comprehensions. We like four, we love four comprehensions over futures, over options, over traversables. It's very nice, we'll see it in a minute. They are more powerful than functors. I can do more things with flat map and map and the other stuff. And if we are talking about functional programming without, without using side effects and uh, the very, very important stuff that I gain, infinite scalability of code, then monads provide me the solution to encapsulate the side effects and bring them out of the code. And the abstraction is called monad and we are going to look into it. Just... Uh, for comprehension, the, syntax in, the for syntax in Scala is actually a monad comprehension. It works over things that are monads. Here, for example, I, have, uh, I will show it uh, with the... Here, like this. Okay, I have two maps. I'm doing a get. I'm getting two options. Okay, sum of one and sum of seven. And then I can do four and work inside the options, getting two ints. I1 and I2 are int return a yield int plus int, return an int, but get an option of int, which is the sum of the results, but uh, if one of them is none, I get a none. Okay, so this is for comprehension. And here is the monad abstraction. A monad abstraction, the contract is two methods, flat map and pure. I don't, don't, don't want to dwell over the pure. This is the contract for the abstraction. And I have many, many, many instances for this abstraction. There are laws, but I will not go over them. Flat map and pure. And the gain. There is a huge amount of gain from the, from the monad abstraction. For example, 
Let's take a look at the sequence method. Very important method, I, very li I like it very much. Just take a look at the signature. This is the implementation, but forget the implementation, the signature. If I'm having a list of monads, a monad can be a list, an option, a try, everything, almost everything you can do a four over. I have a list of monads, I can get a monad of list. List of future, I can get a future of list. Have, almost everyone is familiar with the sequence method of future in a Scala concurrent. By the way, I, they could, and they implemented it, but if they worked with the abstraction, I could get it for free. A little bit slower maybe, but for free. Remember, I wrote it here once, I get it for every monad ever. List of options, option of list. List of try, try of list. List of state, and many, many, many other instances. This is gain. And this is only one method out of hundreds that I can write in the abstract level. And this is very important. I get a very, very, very nice code reuse. Okay? Very good abstraction, very nice one. Actually, not that problematic to work with if I'm only staying with the contract laws and gain, and I'm not, not going over the mathematical definition of monoid in the category of endofunctors or something like that, or, or a container, a context, whatever, just interface, laws, and gain. But, in a, some other methods that I can use with monad, for example, I have a list of something I can call find M, and you use a monad to work with finding some element. I'm going to, not going to go over the game here, as there are many, many examples. Okay, what are popular monad instances? For example, list. I have uh, multiple results, or option, anonymous exceptions, or either try or disjunction, depends on the library or framework you are using. Future, everything with the asterisk is not a proper monad by the laws, but who cares now, okay? Um, Generator for tests, uh, reader for dependency injection, writer for logging, state for global, and there are many, many, many others. Okay, so everything great. We have an abstraction, a good one. We have instances. What's the problem? The problem is that usually in our application, we don't have a single monad. We are working with options. That's great. But we are also working with dependency injection, the reader. We are working with uh, some global variables like cache or counters, which are the state monad, and maybe do some I.O. operations, the I.O. monad. And I have several monads, and I want to, want to work with them. And here I have a problem. Why is that? Because I want to invoke one of my abstraction methods, like sequence, but not over a list or an option, but over an future of option of list. And I'm saying, wait a minute, there's the functor composition that we saw earlier. Maybe monads could do the same. Maybe I can take several monads, list, future, option, try, and uh, state, or writer, and combine them together, get a single monad, and invoke sequence over it. Something like that. And then the problem. Is a monad of a monad a monad? What? The cyclic definition from every aspect. Okay, so apparently, and not apparently, it's actually monads do not compose. You cannot write the signature of composition and implement the signature you can write, the composition you cannot implement. A monad of a monad is not always a monad. Too bad, too bad for us. So, what can we do? We want to use the abstract code. So, you can create a specific instance of some composition of monad. You can create your own monad for list of option. You can create your own monad for option of list. You can create your own monad for future of option of list. And then you will end up with hundreds of implementations for these monads. And no, it's not good. I will not do it. And they will throw, they will throw monads to the garbage. And actually, there are three alternatives of composing monads. Not full composition out of the box like in functors, but in some system, you can do it with either monad transformers, composable interpreters, we are not going to cover it in this presentation, or extensible effects, which we will see. We will compare monad transformers and extensible effects and see how extensible effects fits very nice in the Scala uh, real-world projects. 
And okay, so these are our alternatives, and let's talk a little first about Mona transformers and see the horrible, the horror. Okay, Mona transformers. Well, apparently you don't need to create a monad instance for every composition. You can create a monad transformer for each monad. If you have 12 monads in your application, you can create 12 transformers, and then you can compose them. What is a transformer? A transformer is usually, I will use Scala Z here, but you can use other frameworks, okay? I'm not preaching for Scala Z, I'm just familiar with it, and I will show the code using it. You can create, for example, option T, option transformer. What is an option transformer? Option transformer is a monad transformer that takes a monad in the signature, we will see it in a minute, takes a monad, for example, list in the signature, and then it creates a list of option, monad, a monad for list of option. An option transformer can receive any monad whatsoever and return me a monad for that, external monad, future, whatever, of option. Okay, it knows how to integrate an external monad with option. Okay, so instead of uh, Cartesian products of monads, I get linear numbers of transformers, which is uh, uh, worse than a composition of functors when we have single implementation for compose. Here we have N compositions, N uh, transformers that I need to write. Let's take a look at the uh, basic usage, the nice usage. After that, we will see the horror. So here is the basic usage. I will try for the people behind to here. We have instances, list of options. You see, I have two lists of options. And here I'm using option T from Scala Z. And I'm saying, okay, just take this instance, list of options, and take this, some apply method, some uh, factory. And what I'm getting it here is an option transformer that works with list. This is actually a monad for list of option and the type inside is int. You see, I have option T. Now, what is nice here, that option T provides me similar API to option. It's wrapped by a list, but I can do have work inside the option. I can ignore the list, just have the benefits of list of multiple results, and then I could do a single four, not four inside the four, a single four, and this four will work over the list, inside, inside the options, and return me all of the results, uh, with none being uh, 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 shrinking here. You see this none is shrinking, it will not uh, return the Cartesian product of none here. Okay, it will work. This four is working on the option inside the list. Okay, great. So if I am having now, for example, Remember the sequence method that can take a list of monads and return a monad of list? Now I can use it with list of option or anything of option. And I can comp create a composition here, which is very nice. All the way, all the way, a lot of monads, compose them into a single one and then have the benefits. So if, if it's that great, why we are not using it? Oh, now the problem. Nice solution, no? Okay, let's see a more complex one. In this case, I will open an IDE. Yes, I'm working with Eclipse, probably the only one. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just used to it, so just increase the font size. Just a second. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Okay, here it is. Do you see it in the back? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm having here uh, some uh, domain object item, and I'm having here an item store, some DAO, whatever, uh, retrieve item by key. I'm having here some counter. I want to count things, uh, having a global pseudo mutable state. And here I'm having some uh, business, pure business logic, uh, like uh, take a price and return the price with VAT. And here, let's talk about monads. Okay, so the, here I'm going to use a single monad, reader. 
Reader provides me a dependency injection like. If you're not familiar with Reader, then Reader allows me to specify that I need this item store uh, injection. Compose it for every, every place that I need it, just compose it with the other places that need it. So in the main part of my application, I provide it, and then it will magically propagate to every place that needs the item store. Okay, very nice. Okay, this is the reader monad. Here, reader, I will have someday, no, I have him this one. Oh, this is it. One day I will have the item store, I will retrieve by key according to the key and return the price. Okay, so oh, this is the signature. Item price before that, giving the key, and it will return a reader, something that will need the environment variable, the DAO, and it will return the item. Okay. And here I'm having another effect uh, in if uh, overpriced. No, this is not, not, not yet, not yet, not yet. Stop. Sorry. Here. Here is the flow. What I'm going to do now, I'm just calling item before that for desktop, some item. I'm getting the price. Item before that, getting the price, returning price with that, plus price with that. And what is flow? Flow is a reader. Remember, for working on monads, this one is not option, it's reader, this, the other line is reader also, and what I will get, I will get a reader, provide the item store, here, provide the item store, run the reader, and get the result. Okay, very nice. Single monad, reader, having dependency injection, the value of item store will propagate to all of the invocations, and I will get the result. Okay, this looks very nice. This is without transformers. I'm having a single monad. I don't need transformers. What will happen now when I will add a state? And the second example is this. I'm having a counter. Okay? And I'm having a method called inc if overpriced. I want to increment the counter if I'm working with a price which is overpriced. Overpriced is something bigger than three. Here you see it is. And here is the problem. You can't have one method using reader, the other one using state monad. You can't compose them in a single four. Four expects to be working with the same monad. So I want to work with a monad of state of reader. Hmm, composition of two monads. Then let's do the tr transformer trick. The monad transformer trick. Yeah, great. I will use Clarice. It's the, the transformer trick. And here you see the horror. I need to define in my method that I'm working here with a counter state and the reader of the item store. No way around it. And here in the for loop, oh, what nice one. Here it was working with reader. I need to lift, to wrap it with the state. This will return a state of reader. This will return a state of reader, this will return a state of reader, this will return a state of reader, everything is a single monad now, a composed monad, and everything works fine. But you see, I need to manually lift some of the methods. On the other methods, I need to return the full composition. No way around it. And this is only with two monads. Now let's compose, if I will try to compose another one. Oh my god will be a lift of lift of lift and wrapping and unwrapping and it will be horrible. But, but, I'm having the abstraction. What do I mean by it? And this is important. Remember, even if the code is ugly, even if it's cumbersome, you, you, it's very hard to understand, it's very hard to maintain everything, we still gain the abstraction. Just see it here. I'm having a list of desktop, laptop, egg, whatever. And now I can do the monad sequence. Remember, I have a list of, here I will map it with the item before that and the counter increment, the lift. I have here a list at the end of monads of state wrapping reader. I can sequence it and then run everything over the list. I get the sequence for free. This is the game. It looks like it doesn't worth it. I can sometimes agree. <laughs> the purest part of me says, no, this is still better, but 
no, I can agree that this is very, very hard. And this is the reason why Mona transformers are problematic. Okay? So, the drawbacks of Mona transformers, cumbersome lifting, I need to, to, everything must be of the same type, so if I'm working with reader, no, it's not good, I need to lift it to wrap it with state, to wrap it with uh, writer, to wrap it with I.O. and lift, 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 lift. This is the, the good part. <laughs> I have the ordering. The Mona transformer stack has a specific order. It's a state wrapping reader, not reader wrapping state. The order is important, and the, even if it's not important to me, it's important. And then I try to do something with the reader, I need to unwrap it, uh, uh, propagate something inside. <sighs> Horrible. And adding a new effect, a new monad to the chain, I need to change it. Many, many, many things. I need to lift ear, to lift ear, to wrap it ear. You see? I'm having a small change will cause big change in the code, and still, I prefer it to manual management of monads, okay? But it's not that good solution. What I will present now is a different solution called, called extensible effects, okay? And what are extensible effects? In extensible effects, I'm working with, I define my effects. Effects are actually the monads. I create my effect stack. For example, here is, and don't be scared of the operators, well, just some DSL for creating the effect stack. I want to work with reader for item store, with counter state, with some logging, and it's like a list that I'm doing a plus colon and end with nil. Here, I'm using uh, Etherbor uh, F scala Z uh, for example, but you can choose some other frameworks, and I create my effect stack, okay? And here, the order is not important, okay? I am having this effect, reading, getting from the environment some item store, I want to work with some counter state, I want to work with logger, and the order doesn't matter, and we will see that my functions can focus on a specific effect or combination of effects. They don't need to, to be familiar with the entire effect stack. No lifting, no lifting. And I can handle a specific effect and remove it from the stack of effects. For example, I can say, okay, in, in another layer of my application, I have the item store, so let's feed it through an effect handler and then get rid of this effect. And at the end of the application, I must handle each and every one of the effects until I get the result. The type, the compiler will take care of it. It is extremely type safe. And some consider effect systems like this to be a generalized exception handling, like, okay, it's not try-catch per se, no relationship, but something like I will create a handler that will treat the effect propagated from the code, okay? So, what is the monad here? The monad is a special monad called F. Actually, there's a language called F, which is based on extensible effect, pure functional language. But the monad is F. This will provide me F of the R. The generic type R is the effect stack. Here is the gain. Remember, I want to do a sequence. I can do a sequence over a list of F of the several effects that I've created earlier. So, let's see an example. Ten lines of code are worth more than a lot of talking. Depends on the code, yes. Okay, so let's start here from the beginning. So this is almost the same, actually the same example, but working with effect system. So, I'm, I'm uh, defining aliases for the types I want to work with. So I, I will have counter state. This is the state monad working over a counter. Counter is only holding a value, some int. And I will do an item store reader. This will be the reader monad expecting some item store, the, the DAO from the environment. Uh, item store the trait and the stack. My effect stack will be composed of item store reader and counter state, and that's it. And you will see later that my specific methods are not familiar with the stack. This is important. Why? Because introducing a new effect, I don't want to change everything. It's very important. 
Okay, so price with VAT, pure simple logic. Okay, let's take a look at the reader effect. And here is a method, item price before VAT, I'm having a key, I want to ask the DAO for the item and return the price. So, here is how we do it. We use a generic value R, R will be the external stack of effects. I'm not familiar with it, I don't know what's inside it, okay? But item reader, item store reader must be in that stack. If it will not be in the, in the stack, the compiler will not be happy. This is important. Here, you see this implicit. This means R, and there's a type, uh, type operator here, which means that item store reader must be a member of the stack, effect stack R. Okay, the effect stack, doesn't matter the order. The order can be many, many, many effects, but item store reader must be one of them, otherwise the compiler will not, I will not be able to provide uh, the implementation the, the, on the call site. Okay, and what I will return, I will return an effect, R and the price double. And here, it, uh, here how it looks like, I'm just using the reader effect, ask from, sorry, Eclipse misbehaving, Ask my reader effect for from using R, give me the item store, and item store retrieved by key, retrieve the price. Okay, this is pure business logic. This is calling the reader effect. You see this method is only familiar with the reader effect, with the reader monad, that's it. Okay, now the method that handles the state effect. Okay, so state effect. I'm having some price, I want to check if the price is above 3, then increment the state counter, otherwise leave it as it is. So again, using R as the effect stack, I'm, I must have an implicit evidence that counter state effect is part of the effect stack. I'm returning R of unit, there is no result, only changing of the state. And here is, I take the old count, the old counter, and I will modify it according to, if it's greater than three, then increment by one, otherwise stay as you are. Okay, increment by one or zero. Not very efficient, but good for our example. And now the flow, and here, look. I'm calling, you see I'm calling, I'm having, having a flow of effect, the effect stack. And here, item price before that, with desktop, no lifting at all. Only, what is my stack? get the price. Increment if overpriced. Familiar only with the state effect, the stack. No lifting, no strict ordering, nothing. Business. Okay, let's see how to run it. Okay, so, here is how I will run the item store reader. Okay, provided an item store, I will just invoke the reader with the item store. Here is running the effects, and running the effects is very nice, because here is the flow, I'm run item store reader, provide the item store impel with the flow, it will go to the effect stack, my effect stack is reader state, and no effect, reader state, no effect, the order doesn't matter, no effect it is at the end. And it will automatically take the reader effect part, crunch it down, and return to me only state effect and no effect. I handled the reader, the item reader effect. Now I will run the state starting with counter zero. In compilation time, it will go to the list, remove and handle. According to the type system, it will remove from the type system. I will get here to the run an F monad effect stack with no effect. And then use run to get the result. And actually running it, you will see, you will see here, the sum and the counter, only two items, desktop and laptop were lens greater than three, and the counter was two. Okay, and uh, it's very nice, uh, no, the, the ID ang. <laughs> it's very hard for clips to work with effect stacks. It's, with IntelliJ, I don't know if it's better. Um, so, that's, uh, that's how it looks like. And now, what's good about effect systems? 
extensible effects. Adding an effect, this is important, this is the extensible part. Adding an effect is almost seamless to the existing code base. You can have layers working with different effects. I can introduce a new effect almost seamlessly. No need to work with the order like Mona transformers to decompose, to propagate uh, invocations inside. I work with the effect I want to work with. You see, I have, I have two methods, each working with a different effect. I can work with the effect in the effect stack. The compiler will take care of the things. Uh, if I have uh, several instances of the same effect, I have several states. I have item store reader, I have user, user reader, I have, uh, I don't know, permission reader. I can comp have several effects, tag them. There is support in the library for that. And this is very nice. I can, in one layer of the application, has, have uh, some effect, for example, some option effect using the option monad. And when I go to a different layer, I can just run option over it. it run the handler and get rid of this effect. So I can have effects that are specific for different layers of my application. Yeah, looks very nice, no? So what's the problem? Actually, there is no problem. If you go into search Mona Transformer versus extensible effects, you will get this. Let's start with the second bullet. In lazy programming languages, and then, then you can stop. We are not lazy programming, lazy functional language like Haskell. There, is a, there are some problems with several effects there. We do, you don't care. We are in Scala, strict language. Second one is not important. The first one, there are some monads that when I will use them with extensible effects, in some combination I will break the monad laws. It is extremely, how to say, it's extremely rare. And it usually combines monads like continuation, which most people don't use. So in most effect stacks, you can forget about it and, and uh, just use it. Use it. It's very nice. Uh, I cannot vouch for the integrity and the you know, production ready of the library, but it's not a lot of code. And uh, try it. It looks very nice. So that's it. And questions now. No. No. Questions, questions, no. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yes? Oh, sorry. So Hi. you used F. Is that Mandubian's library? Or one? Etherbor. Okay. Etherbor. I mean, he's just contributing. There's M as well, right? That's, yeah, I, yes, there are several languages are, that you, provide it, yeah. Now, in, in Scala, there's F and M. I don't know. I wondered what the differences were, but maybe F and not a M. Good. I didn't know. No, EFF is the library you used, right? Uh, I used uh, this one, uh, EFF Scala Z. Right. Okay. So there's a different one called EMM. I yeah, I, mean, I, didn't I just wondered I didn't what didn't the differences were. Okay. Thanks. No, this is this one. Oh, you don't see it. It's um, very very small there, but. Uh, I like it. it. It works very nice. Uh, it's not uh, full op fully optimized regarding performance, but close to. Close to. Okay, uh, very nice. It actually works. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, when you work with the uh, EFF type, uh, yes. each type that interacts with the stack had an implicit that you had to pass. This one, like the counter state and the... the, the I work here with the state... Scala Z state monad. So the the type that's the type who provides the implicit to the method call. Do you have to explicitly do it or just by declaring? I'm using uh, here. You can see here I'm using the state effect. This this takes the state monad and wraps it with an effect. But when you call ink if overpriced, who provides R? Do you have to explicitly provide it or this? R? Yes. No. No. Here. You have it uh, automatically from the stack, from oh, the okay. definition of the stack. Okay, thank no, you. No, you don't need. Usually, usually, usually you don't need. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can uh, this stack ID help me with testing, maybe? Have ma? Can this stack ID help me with the testing, integration testing of my whole logic? Oh, testing, it works. Wonderful with testing because here the run item store reader and the run state I can use my own handlers 
and handle them with using mock objects, using whatever. Very, it's very easy to do it. And I can also run several of them uh, production-like integration tests and one of the mock, and I can, I, can, I can provide my own handlers. This is one of the benefits. Hi. So uh, regarding the lifting, uh, actually I know that in Haskell at least, um, so you have things like Monad Reader, Monad Writer, and all of those. So it actually, um, I don't know if they have them in Scala Z or uh, I think they have them in CATS, but I'm not sure. So, what, the, the type classes Monad Reader? Yeah, and exactly. Yes, they so have Monad they class another and type class that actually um, just prevent, prevents the need for, for the lifting. So you can actually, if you have a Monad Reader anywhere in the stack, you'll be able to, to read without... Um, Sometimes, not. When, when you try to compose several monads, you, you, need to, you need to provide the lifting. Or if not the lifting, then if you want to, to invoke a specific method on the, on the reader. Right. Okay, do a map on, on the reader only inside the stack, it's, it's very problematic. It can be done, but it, it requires a lot of trickery. And no, I think here, I think like in Haskell they they provide that out of the box, so so you don't need oh, to. Oh, in Haskell it's it's a little bit more better, but still the ordering you cannot get away with it. The ordering is yeah. problematic here in the effect system. You don't need it. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. I don't think we have time for more questions. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>